we are going to read our Bible today. If you didn't bring one, there are some in the back corners, okay? If you need one, raise your hand and we will make sure someone gets one for you. Does anybody need a Bible? They're free of charge. You don't have to return them if you don't want them. Um, you can return them if you want to. If not, you just take them home. Otherwise, we're all good. Let's pray and we'll read through this, okay? Father, thank You so much for Your Word. Thank You for the power of it, that it's, that it's not docile, but it's active. It's effective in our lives. Lord, help us that we would be more than just readers of it, although that's, that's a good start, Lord, but help us, to be, help us to be doers of this. And Lord, as we examine this text here today, we pray that You would give us a clear and deep understanding of what it is that is taking place in the life of David and how that impacts our life even today. We do ask, as Roger said, that, you, that these people would not hear my words, but, Lord, that they would hear Your words, that they would, Your words would reach deep into their soul and, and transform all of us in this room, God. Thank You for, for preserving this. Thank You for writing this, for authoring this in its purity and allowing us to have a copy of it before us this day that we can study and know and that we can trust. Bless us now in this time that we have, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Psalms chapter 6. Uh, I've entitled the name of the message, I Am Weary, and that's, in, that's right there in verse 6. And weariness does come, doesn't it? Weariness does come to us. He says in verse 1, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thine hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed, but Thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul, O save me for Thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of Thee in the grave. Who shall give Thee thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxes old because of all mine enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. David is again coming to the Lord, and there is a certain weariness. There is a certain weariness that he conveys as we read through this text, and there are times I think that all of us can have a sense of exhaustion, a sense of, uh, of, of uh, being overwhelmed, of being tired, of being wearied by life that happens. You can be wearied by the constant bills that seem to keep coming, right? You can be wearied by the medical trials that come. You can be wearied by the hurt that takes place in our community, and you can be wearied by watching the news sometimes. I look at these articles and I think to myself, where are we going? What is happening to our world? And you can be wearied in your job, in your position, and no matter what you're doing, it can sometimes weigh down on you. And there are times in which all this seems to be bigger than we can handle. David here, though, is not wearied by the circumstances of life. He's wearied because of sin. And we're going to read through, if you, if you want to turn there, in 2 Samuel chapter 11. This psalm forms the beginning of David's penitential psalms in which he is broken over the transgression that is made with Bathsheba. This is not necessarily a, a, a psalm of simple weariness and that I'm overwhelmed because I'm too busy or I'm too distracted. It is a psalm that is, he is weary and he's crying out to God because of this transgression. Sin is that weight that drags us down, that drains our soul of energy and life, that creates that oppressive aura around us. There is a modern psychology that says we simply need to learn some techniques to cope with the failures that we have in life, with the sins that we have brought into our life. These things are, are normal, and if we would simply cope appropriately with these things, all would be well. And yet David is pouring his heart out to God, 
knowing that it's more than just coping techniques, but he needs God to bring a forgiveness. He needs God to, to bring a change to him. See, God has created every one of us with a conscience. Romans chapter 2 teaches that, and every one of us understands what a conscience is. We have this knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. And when we choose wrong, that conscience within us pricks us. And that is the Lord's pricking us to say, you're not doing what is right at this moment. It brings us a feeling of guilt and it brings us a feeling of shame. And so what modern society has done is has tried to say that feeling of guilt and shame, those are antiquated thoughts, let's move past that and let's simply deal with how to cope with this. What, what David is doing is not moving past this, but realizing it is the sin that is causing decay to his soul and is causing uh, hurt to his life, and he is the sin that he must deal with if his soul is ever to be restored. Sometimes, sometimes we look at Bible characters as if they have the cape on. They're superhuman, right? And, and we look at these guys as flawless, and David is a man after God's own heart, and he, he, he had a couple stones, and he took out that Goliath, and he, he did this, and he did that, and yeah, he messed up with Bathsheba, but man, he, he took out Goliath, and he was a man after, he did it, I mean, he is superhuman. You know, what we, as we read through Psalm 6, what we see here is a man that is broken, a man that is on his knees before God because he has recognized the weight of what he has done is awful, and he doesn't feel superhuman at this moment. He doesn't feel as if he is so strong, he is just with God, and with God there's nothing impossible. He feels as low as a man can possibly get. You know what that tells me? It's okay. Sometimes we go, man, how are you feeling today? I feel kind of lousy today. Oh, man, it's okay. Everything's going to be okay. You know, there's sometimes you ought to feel lousy. You know why David felt lousy? Because he had sinned before God. And we sometimes take this very light approach to what sin is. People should struggle when it comes to sin, for it does wound us and it does hurt us. And it can be even people of great faith. I want to, did you turn to 2 Samuel? Because I didn't. So let's go to 2 Samuel. We're going to read this, and I know it's a, it's a little bit of a lengthy story, but it's not that lengthy, so bear with me. Can you bear with me? That's good. Are you ready? 2 Samuel chapter 11. If I read too fast... I apologize now. We'll start in verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the times when the kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbath. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Uh-oh. And it came to pass in verse 2, in the evening tide, that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah? Notice the wife of the, he knows who she is, of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned into her house. Verse 5, And the woman conceived, which tells you some time has gone by. David's heart didn't prick it immediately, did he? And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Notice this man after God's heart didn't just turn and repent, did he? He didn't just say, I can't believe I did this. And now everybody's going to know I'm going to do this. And oh, what a mess this is. You know what he did? What we do. We try to hide. Just like Adam and Eve did when they got busted. They tried to sew some fig leaves together and hide their shame. You know what David did when he got busted? He tried to get out of it his own way. You know what we do when we are confronted with our own sin? Try to cover it up. 
That's exactly what David's doing right here. In verse 7, when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war was prospered. A little small talk. David said unto Uriah, go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down to his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou now from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down to thy house? And Uriah, verse 11, said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and, and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my, law, my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. See what David was trying to do? He brought Uriah home from the war assuming that this man was going to be a little bit homesick for his wife and, and their bed. And so he, he said, hey, how's the battle going? Tell me how's things going. He got the report and he said, okay, go ahead. You're dismissed. Here's a bunch of food. Go home and see your wife. But Uriah said, I can't do that. How can I do that when the ark and the armies of God are in battle right now? This is not the time of pleasure. It's the time of war. Character there, huh? Verse 12, and David said to Uriah, tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and tomorrow. And when David had called him, verse 13, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of the Lord, but went not down to his house. Well, if I can't entice him with food, maybe I'll just get him drunk and see if that loosens him up a little bit, go home and be with his wife. What he's trying to do here, obviously, is get him to sleep with his wife so that when the baby does come out, everybody can say, well, Uriah did come home about this time, and everybody will assume it is Uriah's child. Verse 14, it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Job and sent it by the hand of Uriah, and he wrote in the letter saying, set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. I wonder what's going through David's mind as he writes that. He just condemned a man to death that he met, and he's going to give this man a letter. He's going to give the man this letter to take. He's signing his own death warrant. It came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were, and the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people, the servants of David and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all things concerning the war and charged the messenger, saying, when thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, if, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Verse 21, Who smote Abimelech, the son of uh, Jerubasheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then thou say, Thy servant Uriah and the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field, and we were upon them, even unto the entering of the gate. And the shooter shot from off the wall upon the servant, and some of the king's servants be dead, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said unto the messenger, Thou shalt say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city and overthrow it, and encourage thou them. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. What did David just do? He made a mistake, didn't he? And we all do. It's a really slippery slope, that sin, isn't it? He made one mistake. He looked out and he saw a beautiful woman. And instead of realizing that he was already a married man, he inquired. He found out this woman was married. That didn't seem to stop him, though. So he brought this woman. He called her and they lay together. And then he was told that she is about to have, that she is with child, so he sets up this conspiracy in which to bring Uriah home, 
so that he can deceive the people, which is really a lie. So now he's committed adultery, he's lied, and now he's going to push this man into a battle that he shouldn't be in and essentially murder this man. This is the king of Israel, a man after God's own heart, a man responsible for writing so many of these psalms that we love. You know what he did? He did a whopper. He added some ketchup and pickles to that thing too. We, we have the same potential that David did. And notice we get to the end of this chapter and all he's done is cover his footsteps. He then brings this woman after and marries her and says, this worked out exactly how I had hoped. There is no repentance in this. There's been no confrontation with God. And most of us, when we sin, unless there's a confrontation, we will continue to do exactly what we do because we think we got away with it. That's what happened with David. Look in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. Here's where the confrontation comes. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. Aren't you glad for some Nathans out there? Boy, they sure are prickly fellows though, aren't they? Man, I don't like Nathans when I see them walk into my office, uh, but it's nice to have some Nathans around. And he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the one poor, and the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nursed up, and it grew up together with him, and with his children did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Man, he's a righteous fellow now, isn't he? Did you, did you follow what the story was right there? There's a rich man and there's a poor man. The rich man has a guest in his house. And he looks out onto his flock and he says, I don't really want to kill any of my lambs for this guest. Go get that man's lamb that has nothing. I mean, the lamb to that man was as his own daughter. It was like the family pet, if you will. He went and killed that. When the king hears the story, he says, what kind of wretched man would ever do something like this? Hang him by his toes. He deserves death. Verse 7, and Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. You're that jerk, buddy. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the houses of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover have given unto thee such and such things. David, I gave you everything, and if you would have asked for something more, I would have given you that. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of thy children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house. Verse 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord has also put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Wow. Psalm chapter 6. This psalm is written after David understands what he really did with Bathsheba. After what he really did, God would have given him anything that he asked for, and yet he defiled this other man, his wife, he lied, he covered it up, he did everything he could to cover his tracks. Let's go back to Psalms chapter 1 as we see this text unfold a little bit more now that we've read that. I know it took some time to do that, but we see in verse 1, after we've just read what he did, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thine hot displeasure. David 
David is admitting his wrong here. There are many times that we sin and we do wrong, and sometimes we, we find ways, we find cracks to say, well, it wasn't really my fault, or, or, or these things happened. But David here is, it realizes that it is completely his failure. It is completely his fault. He is not hiding behind the, the circumstances. He's not hiding behind the culture. He is not hiding behind uh, anything else. He is hiding, uh, he's looking before God and simply saying, I am at fault here. He is taking full responsibility for the weight of his sin. There are times when people say, well, there's other kids at school that are doing it. There's people at work, you know, that are doing the exact same thing. Why can't I do it? And we look and we say, well, it's not really that big of a deal to lie. I mean, other kids at school are cheating on exams. It's common to cheat in school. Don't you know that? What's the big deal? Man, it's common to look at, at, at pornography. It's common to, 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 to fib to your parents. It's common to take a little bit more or to show up a little bit late and leave a little bit early. It's common to do that. We're all so very good at justifying our sin. You know what happened here? David got a big dose of Nathan. And when he got a big dose of Nathan, it's like God opened up his soul and revealed to, to himself, it revealed to David who he really is in all of this. I want you to look in Proverbs chapter 3. Because in this text here, he says, Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thine hot displeasure. He's saying, he's saying, please be gentle with me in all of this. Proverbs 3, are you flipping? I can't, I can't hear flipping. I need to hear flipping. Flip, 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 thank you. Proverbs 3 for whom the Lord, verse 12, for whom the Lord loveth, what does he do? He correcteth. Who of us in here that has children, man, if you love your children, you must correct your children. You know what David did? He sinned against God, and so what God did is he said, I love you so much that I need to correct you. Look in Proverbs 13. 13, verse 24, and these are not, these are not, text that we, uh, that our culture embraces a whole lot these days. Proverbs 13, verse 24 says, he that spareth his rod, what's that say? Hateth his son, but he that loveth him, chasten him. And if you love, if you love your children, you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to chasten him. You're supposed to correct them. When our children go down a path that we know is wrong and is hurtful for them, what kind of parent would I be if I just allowed them to continue in that folly? And the same thing is true as our Lord. When he saw David, he said, this thing displeases me. And so instead of God just saying, well, you know, everybody's going to do what everybody's going to do. This is just humanity. He sent Nathan to confront him and to correct him of his ways. You know what happens when I correct my children? They cry. They don't like it. You know what happens here when God corrects David? He cries because it hurts a little bit. It, it seems so much that we just, we just want to just shake off. We just want to shake off our sin. Well, God's forgiving. Praise the Lord. Let's move on. The grace of God is sufficient. Let's just move on. You know, the grace of God and the, and the goodness of God were still true in David's time, and yet here his soul is wide open to him, and he is distraught. He is, he is broken before the Lord because he understood the weight of this sin. Look what he says in verse 2. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. Mercy is by definition, is not receiving what we do deserve. What David deserved was death, but God gave him mercy. David is in need of mercy because he had committed a real transgression against man and against, against God. We are also a people that are in need of the Lord's mercy. This is not some entitlement or childish sorrow. This is deep. It is causing his bones to be 
In fact, David is feeling physical discomfort because of the weight of this sin is so immensely heavy to him that it is physically becoming a burden to him because of sin. Have you ever felt that kind of weight? I mean, do we relate with this at all? Or, or, or do we just kind of brush it off and go, man, I'm thankful for the cross. We don't ever have to feel that, right? And I do get the cross, but there should be a point in which we understand the weight of our sin. Maybe we have made such a, a light view of our sin in, in, in 2018. The road to salvation seems paved with, you know, participation awards and free giveaways. But not so. Salvation is the path of repentance. I want you to look with me in the New Testament here. Are you ready to flip again? Luke 13. Flip, swipe, swipe, flip. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3. I hope you're tracking with me. All doing okay? I got a thumbs up. That's good enough. Luke 13, verse 3. In verse 5, he says almost the exact same thing. I tell you, this is Jesus, it's red letters. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Jump over to Acts chapter 2. Repentance doesn't get a whole lot of attention these days because we simply live in a world where, you know, I, I messed up, let's move on. The past is in the past. Man, David didn't move on. He wrote a bunch of psalms to deal with it because he was broken before God. Did you find Acts 2? Verse 38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. See, the problem is sin, isn't it? He didn't say just, you know, if you want this ticket into heaven, if you want this life insurance policy, if you want this. He said, we've got to deal with the issue. The issue is our sin. Acts 17, verse 30. It says in verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to what? Repent. Say it with me. Repent. Repent is the word. Acts 20, verse 21, let me read this for you. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 2 says it this way, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and the forbearance and the long suffering, knowing not that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. A little bit of chastisement from the father actually brings the child to the place of, of, of understanding. The lights go on and the child goes, thank you for correcting me. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Look in 2 Corinthians. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Are we doing too many verses? Are we okay? Vinny, you sticking with me? Okay. Vinny's got a thumbs up over there. This side, I know the Spirit doesn't work as much on this side of the auditorium, so I just, uh, you know, he's ordained, so I had to just find out if the Spirit was. Verse uh, 9, did I say 2 Corinthians 7? Verse 9, it says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you, you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us and nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of this world worketh death. He says there, sorry, sorry doesn't cut it. Sorry is not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is sorrow. Sorrow. Sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. You know, when somebody is broken of their sin, the worst thing you can tell them is, it's okay, God just loves you, don't worry about it. You know what? Let them suffer in their sorrow a little bit. Let them feel the weight of that thing, because as a person feels the weight of that thing, they're going to understand 
what Christ has done in, a, in, a, in much more of a profound and deep manner. Verse 3 of Psalm 6, my soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? David continues, he says, he said it was my bones, now he's saying it's, it's his soul. He's, he's been impacted to the, the core of his life. He says, how Lord, 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 how long? He, he doesn't know how much more he can handle this weight. I, I don't know how much longer I can deal with this burden, the sin he, he is guilty of, this horror and the consequences after he's realized what he has done. How much more can I, can I deal with this? See, there are, there are consequences to decisions that we make. David, had a, his cover-up was pretty solid. He did a decent job of making this thing go away. But, you know, there are scars that, that always occur. And I can show you things that I, dumb things that I did as a child that, that, uh, that are now little marks on my body. And as I look at them, I go, oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and I look at my knee and I go, oh, I remember that, right? Because I did something and, and, the, and the penalty of that was a scar. I don't feel the pain of it anymore, but I look down and I see a scar, you know, David, he has this hurt, he has this pain, he always is going to carry a scar because of what he has done. There is so much that we can say about the consequences of our decisions, and there I realize there are not always immediate consequences, whether you look at, whether you look at political corruption or police brutality or domestic violence or you name it. Sometimes it seems like people get away with it, don't they? But at some point, it will catch up to them because no matter how many coping techniques you find, it's in your soul. It's in your soul. And there's only one that can deal with the soul, and that's our Lord. To the alcoholic, to the sexually immoral, to the disobedient and rebellious, to the greedy, to the proud, to the arrogant, to the lustful, there are always scars. David thought he got away with it, and I've thought I've gotten away with a lot of my things too. But they catch up with you, and there's always scars that are there. Verse 4, return, O Lord. David is looking for the nearness of God. He lost that. He, where there is nearness of God, there is completeness, there is contentment, there is purity, there is protection, there is hope, there is healing, there is strength. In Psalm 51, he says, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done evil in thy sight. Again, he's taking this, he's taking this all upon him. Notice in verse 4 of this text, you, you see where it says, return, O Lord. Look in verse 3, O Lord. Look in verse 2, O Lord. Look in verse 1, O Lord. We, we see here four times in this section he is called out, O Lord, Jehovah, the sovereign God of all, I need you. Have you, have you watched these, uh, this volcano thing in, in Hawaii? It's fascinating, this, these eruptions that just continue to go on and on and on and on, and these pictures, the images of this, this volcanic mass that's just coming down these roads and, and, just, and just devastating everything in its way. There's absolutely nothing they can do to stop this. And as I looked at those pictures of the literal, it's fire, right? And it just spews out, and, and once it's been loosed, there's no containing it. It goes wherever it wants to do, wherever it wants to go. You know what? What a great picture of sin that is. You cannot control. Once it has been let loose, you don't get to control what happens anymore. It just brings destruction everywhere it goes. He says, oh, Lord, God Jehovah, the one that can control volcanoes, would you, would you control my sin again? Verse 5, he says, for in death there is no remembrance of thee in the grave. Who shall give thee thanks? David turns to the pity of God. He says to God, in essence, 
there's, there's no benefit in me dying like this, right? I mean, I mean, you're merciful, and what, you know, you're not going to end up getting any thanks. I mean, so I, I know that you desire, and let's face it, if you, if, if you restore me, I promise you I will give you thanks in all of this. God often does pardon us. Verse 6, he talks about the groanings. And he says, I am weary with my groaning all the night. Make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. There is something about groaning in the Scripture. Exodus chapter 2, why don't you turn there? We're doing okay. Exodus chapter 2. This is the story of the children of Israel being in Egypt. Exodus chapter 2 and verse 24. Look what it says, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered His covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. In chapter 3 and verse 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. Exodus chapter 6, it says, and I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel. See, sin should bring us to the place of brokenness where we cry out to God where we're broken before God, and when we, when we can cry out to Him and ask and realize we deserve nothing, we deserve hell, we deserve death, that's what David deserved, but we begin to see and we cry out so badly based on the character of God, we simply cry out for His mercy. Flip with me to Ephesians chapter 2. I love this text. Are you flipping? Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 4 a powerful little truth wrapped up in the mercy of God that's in here. You find it? Ephesians 2, verse 4, he says, but God, who is what? Rich in mercy. He doesn't run out of that, does he? Isn't that great that it's, it, it's new each and every morning? Great is his faithfulness. He says, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Isn't that wonderful? Man, in, 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 we were dead in our sins. David was dead. He was messed up. You know where we are? We were messed up. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love with what He loves us, oh, what a blessing that is to know that God is gracious. In verse 6, we see David is weeping and crying all night long because of his sin, he woke up in the morning and his pillow and his sheets and his blanket are wet for the tears that he shed over his own sin. I found this quote by Spurgeon. He said, tears are like liquid prayers before God. When we can no longer pray with words, it's like those tears is what God hears the most of. Well, that's true brokenness, isn't it? True brokenness. Finally, in verse 7, he says, grief, it says, grief had filled him, but as for me, where am I? Verse 7, sorry, mine eye is consumed because of grief, even, man, once you're in a bad spot, you're in a bad spot, aren't you? Everything you look at seems like grief now. He had these glasses on, and, and, and no matter what he sees, he sees grief. His soul is vexed. His, his life is struggling. He's hurting. He's in pain. His, his bones, his physical, every part of him. See, when your soul is not at peace, there is no peace. You can buy new clothes, look in the mirror and go, man, I look nice, and that lasts about a minute. You can go buy a new car. You can have a midlife crisis. You can get a new wife if you'd like. Go on a destination vacation. But when your soul is not at peace, there is no peace. And so what has to happen is a person has to get at peace with God in order for their soul to be at peace. Finally, there's a change in verses 8 through 10. We see in verse 8, he says, Depart from me, all you workers. The Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. He heard those cries, didn't he? The Lord has heard my supplications. The Lord will receive my prayer. 
Let, verse 10, let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them all, or let them return and be ashamed suddenly. It, it's like God is restoring him. There are those that have that mocked him and derided him and, 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 and brought hurt and oppression because of sin. He says, let them be ashamed. And you know what does take place? When we, when we, when we sin, there are certainly those people that kick you when you're down. Now, sometimes, sometimes you need a Nathan to point a finger in your face. And, and every church needs its Nathans. Every life group, everybody needs accountability. Because without it, we're left to our own sin. But once you've stuck your finger in that person and said, what did you do that for? You don't then need to knee them in the gut either. You don't need to kick them in the face when they're down. You don't need to make fun of them for what they did again and again and again. And I can't believe a person of your stature and reputation and family and name would ever do something like that in essence spit on them. That's not Christian. That's not how we, that's not how we play this whole thing. That's not what's supposed to take place in all of this. David, David calls these people <laughs> enemies. How can we be the family of God and brothers and sisters in Christ? It's one thing to confront somebody with sin. It's another thing to kick them when they're down. That's not right. David didn't need more people to lump harsh words and reproof. He needed people to help him pull out of the mud and out of the darkness. Turn to, to, to Matthew 11. We'll finish with this text here. Matthew 11, verse 28 Matthew 11, verse 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. You know where you find rest for your souls? Jesus. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come unto me. Come unto me. This is where it all comes back. Man, you, can, you, know, you know the word psych? You know the word psychology? Psych, that word psych is the Greek word for soul. So when you study psychology, you know what you're studying? It's the study of the, the soul, okay? Now, of course, uh, many of our modern institutions have divorced that word from the study of the soul into just the study of the mind and the body, but really, it's the study of the mind, the body, and the soul. But there's only one that it can, actually, can actually heal the soul. He says, come unto me, and I will give you rest to your soul. Many people were looking for, for, for things to, to soothe our soul and to give us comfort and help. And all the time, you know what that problem is with our soul? We're not dealing with our sin. And so we're going to doctors and we're, we're going to uh, counselors and saying, what do I need to do? I feel, I feel this oppression. I feel this weight. I feel this heaviness. Instead of them pointing to the cross, we're trying to cope and deal with this. David, he didn't cope and deal. He wept before God. And then he came unto him weary and broken. And Jesus gave rest unto David's soul. Just like David, just like Jesus gives rest to us when we actually are confronted with our sin. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. David, he did a whopper. Supersized that thing even. But if we put up the highlight reel of your life and my life, we probably wouldn't be too far off. Doesn't it make the grace of God so much more amazing when we stop and think about the weight of our sin? I don't want you to leave here going, man, that was a downer. That was real heavy. I'm going to go home and cry myself to sleep tonight. 
And maybe you should cry yourself to sleep tonight. Maybe you should stop thinking of your sin, your lying, your lust, your greed, your covetousness. Maybe we should stop thinking that so lightly. Well, I've been forgiven. Everything's good. Grace, grace, God, okay. It's all good. It's all good. I got my, look, I got my, it says in the beginning, it says in my Bible, I was, I said the prayer on this day. David was a man after God's own heart. Broken. Let's be a people that are broken because of sin. And then let's come get healing for our souls by the only one, the only great physician that can touch my soul, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together.